Osio, Ostosunali, the Dawa Doa, the Lenake, Diane Carol Chun Studi Kwood, Chi Chalagi, Aya, Oklahoma. Hi, I am Delana Studi. I'm a proud citizen of the Cherokee Nation from Oklahoma, and I'm currently speaking to you from Oklahoma, which is the Cherokee Nation, the original homelands of the Cato, the Kickapoo, the Osete Shikoan, and the Osage. And I would like to say thank you and welcome to our session from Birch and Cedar to Olive Trees, Native Artist in Solidarity. And we are joined today by an amazing panel that I can't wait for you to meet. And like me, they will introduce themselves in their own language because it's very important for us to speak our native tongue. It proves our sovereignty, something that we are constantly trying to find and trying to keep and also trying to restore. So um, I believe they'll be joining us very soon, but I also want to take a moment to acknowledge everyone that's tuning in today. Thank you so much. We know we're all coming in from different time zones, so I appreciate you taking the time to be here today. And if you're wanting more information, you may do so by um, going to HowlRound. All the sessions, including this one, will be archived and you'll be able to watch them there as well. And so without further ado, I believe we can introduce Marissa Carr, Apilanatet, and Princess Johnson. Hi, Apilanatet. Hi, Princess. And I believe Ms. Marissa will be with us. And so I'll let you introduce yourselves. We'll start with uh, Apilanitet. Hi. Hello there. Kwam uh, Kamel Mohamo. Greetings. I am uh, Opalanyatet, also known as uh, Ryan. Um, and I'm Nanakoke Lenny Lenape uh, from New Jersey and Delaware. And I'm also the founder and artistic director of Eagle Project. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Wado, well, thank you, Apilanyatet. Hello, Princess. OCO. Uh, Van Gwinzi, Shalaknai, Shoji Dajayoji, Nets Igojins, uh, Ashkenazi, Ithi, uh, Aizaria, Shagotlit, uh, uh, Jukvan, Shadri Sho Ithi. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Princess Dajai Johnson. I'm Nets Igojin from Alaska. My, camp my family comes from Arctic Village on my mother's side, and I'm Ashkenazi on my father's side. Um, and I was born in the West Bank in Aizaria, and um, just so um, grateful to be in this conversation with you all. So Masit, Masit Cho to the organizers and Delena for facilitating us. Well done, Princess. Hi, Marissa. Hey, please you. I mean, I mean, I'm a big friend of the Gondashinabe morning, Marissa Carr and the Shinakaja Ponashi morning. Uh, hello, Buju. My name is Marissa Har. Uh, my name is Nava. My name is Mani Bukwe. I am Turtle Mountain Ojibwe from the Turtle Clan, although I currently reside in Chicago. Uh, I'm very, very grateful uh, to be here with you all today. Um, and I am a Nishinaabu theater artist, um, playwright, and administrator. Odo, thank you, Marissa. I am so honored to be in the Zoom room with all of you. Um, just so everyone knows, these are some amazing theater and um, television TV artist, and we are so grateful for the the artistry they bring in telling our stories and keeping our cultures and our language alive. And so I just want to acknowledge that before we even start. Um, and then I guess my first question to all of you is, you know, um, how did you get involved in today's program and what made you say yes to joining? I know for Princess, it was, it's what, 6.30 where you were in Alaska in the morning. So uh, we want to acknowledge that you got up really bright and early to be with us today. So thank you. So uh, just that's my question is, how did you hear about this? And, and why was it important for you to say yes, to coming in to talk up today about what we're talking about? Princess, would you like to start with that one? Sure. Um, so, well, you sent me an invitation, Delena, and I said, yes, we need to do this. So um, critical um, that we um, show our support and solidarity um, for what is happening. And I'm, and I'm encouraged um, because there is a wave, like unprecedented amount of 
um, support that I see um, of human beings just coming out and saying no to genocide um, and showing that we can't let this, you know, continue, whether it is in Palestine, Gaza, whether it's in Sudan, Congo, et cetera. Uh, we really need to band together. Um, so, and, and this is very personal for me. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, I happen to be born in a Palestine, Palestinian village called Izaria. It's above the Mount of Olives in the West Bank. Um, I was not raised there. I left when I was, my parents left when I was 18 months. Um, and I'll talk more, I'll talk more about this later. Um, but uh, the Palestinian people, I was delivered on the kitchen table of a Palestinian doctor of, in the village. And um, the Palestinian people took care of my family, of my mother, who was, you know, Gwich'in somehow found herself there with my Jewish father. And um, my father and his nephew were the only Jewish people in that neighborhood at that time. Um, so I just have a a tie there. I was born there. My umbilical cord is there. And um, my solidarity could not be stronger as somebody who is also Indigenous um, and understands um, the violent acts of, uh, of genocide and forced removal and, you know, that type of history. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Avi Linichet? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, well, for for this initial gathering, um, I spoke with um, Andrea at, um, at at the TCG conference uh, just this past June in, in Chicago, and um, basically, I mean, my my history is um, with my company Eagle Project. We did a collaboration with Ashtar Theater, uh, which started back in 2019. Uh, we did and uh, we did a um, uh, a workshop. Um, here in New York City, uh, called the Eagle Goes East, which was a, a, a Palestinian and Middle Eastern and Native American um, uh, collaboration, and we did it here on the Lower East Side. Um, later on that year, I did a workshop of uh, my solo show. This this play is Native Made, um, whereas as I told people, no theater here in the U.S. Uh, I wanted to deal with that because uh, it, it dealt with the the. Uh, attempt to take away uh, my tribal nation's uh, state recognition. Um, and so Ashtar Theater was the only theater um, in the, um, that, that would help uh, lend a helping hand to that. And so, uh, so we went to the West Bank for about 10 days um, and did a workshop there uh, for, for their audience. Um, and it was a, a, a tremendous experience. And um, the play opens with an officer coming in to stop uh, the production basically saying that we can't we, this production cannot continue because it's this native made and you can't you can't say that and so and it was interesting seeing the officer come in and stop the performance in the West Bank where the audience had a very visceral reaction as as I as I learned that that's something that's not un, uncommon there um so uh, so I'm, I'm forever grateful uh, for Ashtar theater uh for for their solidarity and support and so given this Given this extremely difficult time, you know, you, you wonder, you know, what can I do? What can I do? And unfortunately, in our industry as it currently stands, it's, it's not always easy to do that. So, um, so knowing Andrea through TCG, um, she was one of the first people I would go to to ask, you know, what you know, is there anything that uh, um, the, that I can do? And, and she rec and she suggested this. I love that. Thank you so much, Abdullah for sharing that. And thank you for doing what you do. Uh, hi, Marissa. Hi, um, it's important for me to be here today um, for a couple of reasons, and they're pretty simple. Um, the first is that you know, what is happening in Gaza right now is genocide. Um, and as a human being, um, I feel called uh, to stand against that and in solidarity um, with the Palestinian people, uh, very simply as a moral issue. Um, you know, beyond uh, having a strong stance as a human being against genocide, which um, should not be a controversial opinion, uh, but somehow it has become one, right? Um, as a Native person to the U.S. in particular, um, I see so many parallels between 
the way that my tribal nation and other tribal nations on this land um, have suffered um, through the violent processes of similar colonialism and how that very much parallels um, what is happening uh, to Palestinian people now and what has been happening um, to Palestinian people uh, throughout the occupation of their lands. And so in the big picture of what's happening, um, getting on his own for an hour feels like such a little thing to do. Um, but uh, I think that any opportunity that any of us have uh, to do anything, how can we not? No, thank you for that, especially because you're right. It's a, it's an hour. What else can we do? I mean, honestly, it's it's the least. And so I'm so grateful that you're all here. And you know, the reason why I'm here is I was I I too was at uh, the TCG conference, which is the Theater Communications Group conference in Chicago, and I got to see Apiolanita and Marissa and on and Andrea or Andrea, and um, we had this amazing conversation. And one of the things that I was speaking with Andrea about was you know, the parallels between my people, the Cherokee and our forced removal in the 1830s and what's going on now. And um, we were talking about how often we're the only person, you know, in the room that can speak for our, our people. And, and there was a point where you're just, you're just tired of crying. You can't go in and cry to these, you know, in most of these cases, predominantly white folks that are in the room, because that's what they want to see. They want to, they want to feel something from your tears. And that reminded me of what we call, you know, the trail of tears, which is where, um, which was the forced removal of my people, the Cherokee. We, um, in Cherokee, the word means the trail where they cried. And my father said, it wasn't because we Cherokee cried because we were, we didn't want them to see our tears. We call it the trail where they cried because it was all the the bystanders who watched us walk by and did nothing and felt ashamed. And that's what this reminds me of, because I feel, especially with what Marissa just shared, there's so many people who won't call this a genocide or who are afraid to call it a genocide or just don't even acknowledge it is a genocide. And, you know, they are those bystanders. Those are the, those are the people that I, I hope are feeling ashamed for not speaking out and speaking up. And, you know, I've had several conversations with Princess about this. In fact, uh, Princess is the one that came up with the title for today's presentation, uh, From Birch and Cedar to Olive Trees, because um, birch is a sacred, tea, sacred tree to her people, and cedar is a sacred tree to my people. And uh, just, we were talking about how they were destroying the olive trees and how that was similar to what they did with the buffalo. Uh, when you destroy a person's food source, that is an act of genocide when you try to purposely find every way possible to eradicate them. And so, um, you know, there's just so many parallels that can be drawn to our own people. And I just wanted to, without re-traumatizing all of you, because I know that, you know, our past is very tangible. It affects, even though for my people, where we were forcibly removed in the 1830s, which wasn't really that long ago, friends, um, but because of the American policy on assimilation and um, removals and near genocide with the boarding schools, the Indian Relocation Acts, uh, the Indian Religious Acts, everything, it's it affected the way I grew up. And it's still something that we're still overcoming. So I just want to acknowledge that our history is very tangible. It's in our DNA. It's in our marrow. And we carry it with us. And sometimes, you know, these moments like this, even though um, it is something that happened to, you know, my grandparents, it's still something that's happening to me. So I just want to call that into the room, but if you would like to speak about the parallels between your own people and what's going on and why it's important to speak out, I would love to hear that. I'll be um, Sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll go ahead and start. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there, there are many things. I mean, I, I think one of the things is, is obviously the, the, um, the loss of land and also, but also the, the, the attempted cultural erasure and then usurping of, 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 of what is yours as, as part of the colonizer. Um, 
And I, I, I just uh, and as an example, like in in Lenape Hoking, there is a space in in southern New Jersey that is the formal former place of the Brotherton Reservation, uh, which is where they try to uh, take all the Lenape in that area and put them onto this little piece of land, um, you know, away from away from the coast and the water from you know where they would often do their fishing or anything, and put them on on this land. And of course, it failed. And once it failed, then the forced removal started, and 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 they all had, um, or supposedly, the, according to the state, they all left. And they said, okay, you know, there are no Lenape um, left in New Jersey. And even though that was not true, um, and that's what the state said for two hundred years. So um, there there are many. Uh, there, there are many things in terms of both the the violence and the politics that I think are are directly related, and and also from Palestinian colleagues that I spoke of, whose you know, families came here and elsewhere, it reminds me of the um, kind of the bifurcation of the Lenape diaspora. Um, I have, there are members of our of our nation that were removed 200 years ago, and so thus there are some there are Lenape in the you know, Delaware Nation of Oklahoma, there are Lenape in the Delaware. Uh, communities in Ontario, as well as Wisconsin, and those of us who um, kind of, as my ancestors would say, we were prisoners on our own homeland, um, and thus could not practice a culture for centuries. And that's, you know, for us, some of it's lost. It's one reason why I unfortunately do, you know, um, some of us, you know, while we know some Lenape language, we we, we don't speak it fluently because it was illegal for so long. So, um, so you know, I, I, all 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 those things remind me of what's going on in Palestine, and 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 also the sometimes the the having to watch how you, um, as I said before, sometimes in our industry it, it, it can feel tough to to share your opinion and 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 show your your solidarity. And I know for a long time, um, you know, it was also the same way uh, here on the East Coast uh, with our Native communities. I just want to jump in because I also come from a tribe that is bifurcated now by the U.S. Canadian border, um, which in nation we go all the way into um, Canada, and um, that it it the borders, the man-made borders, whether they be political or the walls, right, that separate um, <clears throat> the West Bank. I feel very strongly that that, you know, I, and, and this theme of, of land and our connection to land, um, our ability to honor and go and reach our sacred sites and pray at those sacred sites um, is, uh, to me, a, a devastation to be, to be separated like that. And we have community members that, you know, for years, we had all this freedom of movement, the Yukon River is right there connecting us, but we couldn't go back and forth anymore. And I just came from our tribe's um, biannual Gwich'in gathering where we have a, tri a tribal member from that side who um, has direct lineage to um, a really great leader named Shenyati. Um, and his gravesite is not far from where we were, and we all visited together. But that was his first time. He's 36, you know, he brought his family that he came to Alaska and was able to go go there. And um, I just really want to hold and verbalize um, that we share in our prayers and our vision um, a free Palestine and freedom of movement and the right of return and land back, you know, these are all things that we should be putting our energies towards. Um, and so I think the more that we have these conversations out in the open, because they have, this is very suppressed history. Um, and, you know, I, from the time I was 12 onwards, I went to Hebrew school on and off. And I remember wanting to and that's part of that's a beautiful thing about the Jewish religion and culture. They you're encouraged to ask questions. Just I feel like when I did ask questions, and as I started learning more about the history, um, political history, that it was too complicated. Like, I mean, that I've I literally heard that, you know, numerous times. And so I think it's really important. That is another similarity that we have as I think indigenous people or people of color around the world is the dominant narratives that have been coming out of Hollywood, which, uh, you know, I recently heard it was uh, 
uh, another author, Nguyen, like uh, I'm forgetting his name, say, you know, is a propaganda machine. Hollywood is, is a propaganda machine. And that really continues to this day. And so for, you know, to be able to, and, you know, Delaney, you started us off with like, where do we find our news? Um, and so, um, you know, for me, even I was not as, had not gone as in depth into the history. And now I have read a uh, hundred years war on Palestine, right, by Rashid Khalidi. I have read, you know, Edward Said, and you know, we should be, you know, doing our best to, you know, educate ourselves on the issue. While at the same time, Marissa, it's really simple. It is about just like you said, just like human being a human being, being a good human being, um, and loving one another, and continuing to hold the, you know not just hold, but exercise as a practice daily, our values as human beings, caring for one another. And that extends, of course, to the land. Um, so there's so much to be said here. Um, I'm going to hand it to you, Marissa. Thanks, um, Princess. I really uh, like what you said about uh, yeah, being a good human being, extending love and compassion towards each other. Um, you know, and um, I want to say, I think that in the context of settler colonialism, right? Like we extend that love and compassion to Native people. We extend that love and compassion to. Um, you know, uh, our brothers and sisters in Palestine and also to settlers, right? Because, um, you know, in the United States, um, you know, there are a lot of folks who are settlers who came to this land um, because things were pretty bad where they came from before. And, um, of course, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, of course, um, a lot of the um, folks who settled Palestine also were um, refugees from the Holocaust, right? And I think that we can have compassion for those experiences and say, and also, right, like, I have compassion for what you went through um, and also what is now happening is not okay. This is genocide. This is destructive how do we learn to all have compassion from each other uh, or for each other um, and find um, some kind of peace and healing because this is not it, right? Like, this is not the way. Um, you know, in terms of uh, parallels between my people uh, and um, what's being done, um, by the state of Israel to Palestinian people right now. I mean, there are so many pal excuse me, parallels um, with Native people as a whole, right? It's um, the theft of land, it's concentration, it's um, being forced into an open-air prison, it's physical um, and cultural genocide, um, and that all of that is being done in a certain sense in the name of God, right? Because in the United States, too, um, part of the logic of settler colonialism was manifest destiny, right? The idea that, like, we can take this land because we believe that God wanted us to have it. Um, but I think that uh, if you look at um, some of the things that have happened to Native people in the U.S. and what's happening to people in Palestine right now, um, what kind of God would want that? What kind of God would look at that and say, yes, that was what I intended? Um, that's um, that's how I want you to live on this earth. Um, that doesn't that doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, in terms of my people specifically, um, something that I think about a lot is um, in 1850, four Ojibwe people uh, in Minnesota, where I used to live um, for a long time. Um, there was something that we call the Sandy Lake tragedy, where um, several thousand Ojibwe people were told, come to Sandy Lake, um, you know, the United States government will, will have food for you there, we'll, we'll be safe there, um, and that was not the case. We were not safe there. There was not food there. Um, 
hundreds of Ojibwe people died, which out of the number um, of folks that went there was a pretty significant portion. Um, and so when I watch, excuse me, um, when I read in the news, when I see in my Instagram feed, um, people in Gaza being told, go to Rafa, like, we'll be safe there. Um, and then, no, there's um, there's no safety anywhere. And how and where can there be safety um, within the settler state for people that state uh, is actively trying to eradicate, right? Because that's part of the logic of settler colonialism, that in order for our state to exist and be legitimate, we cannot exist simultaneously. We have to be erased. Um, you know, I think about land theft to, um, you know, for my tribe specifically, the turnaround from the end of Ojibwe. Um, 90% of the reservation land that was originally allotted to us um, was stolen by the United States government after it was promised and allotted to settlers to farm to the point that um, there was no longer enough reservation land left um, to allot to um, all of the members of the tribe. So even though my reservation is in North Dakota, my family's trust land is like in a random place in Montana because um, the United States government was like, well, uh, here you go, um, right? And like, which land is that? Um, and, but so of course, um, you know, my tribe has some um, specific experiences around life theft, um, as of course, um, do, you know, all Native nations, um, within the settler colonial state that's then known as the United States um, and uh, Canada also, of course. Um, and so um, also seeing the constant um, pushing of the Israeli state to take more and more pieces of Palestinian land, to take more and more Palestinian homes, um, you know, feels very much like a direct parallel to um, the experiences of my tribal nation and so many of our tribal nations. Thank you, Marissa. I appreciate that. And yes, so many, I love watching all the hit nods who are just all in unison at one point. It was amazing. But, um, you know, and I also find, you know, one of the parallels that you talked about, I think both of you have, have talked about is where do we get our news and, and how do we get this information? Because I do feel that's also part of the process of, of what's happening is, if we don't know the truth, if no one's reporting the truth, we're not seeking out the truth. And we've seen this happen with our individual tribal nations here in the United States. Uh, whenever something is happening to our people, it rarely gets reported on the national news. You have to find a native news network to get the truth, especially when Standing Rock is happening. I think that's one of the biggest instances where, you know, the media is always failing us or refusing to report on us or just honestly they don't even acknowledge our existence. So therefore we, we get nothing. And so we have to actively find it. And so I feel that's, you know, like I said, the media coverage that's here in the United States and possibly elsewhere is abysmal. It's they're not doing their jobs. And so that means we have to actually go out and find the, the, the resources ourselves because no one else is doing it. And, you know, I, I said this at the beginning, but I'll repeat it now, you know, um, some of the best resources have been in the past 24 hours for 24 hours for Palestine, what we're doing right now, and that this will be archived on HowlRound. So you can go back and rewatch um, sections that you didn't get to see um, because they are going 24 hours. And I have not gone 24 hours. <laughs> I did. I did sleep last night and I apologize for that, Andrea. Um, but uh, the team has it. The team has been going on stop. And I want to just acknowledge the work that they're doing so that we can get this knowledge out there. We can have these conversations. And um, for those of us who may have missed an episode or two or a session or three, uh, you can go and find them. They will be available. But, you know, I also feel like that's part of the process, right? They, they render us subhuman um, or as, you know, or invisible. So that way they don't have to think about us at all. And so um, I just want to acknowledge that. And also, um, I know that when we were talking about what this panel would be. We also wanted to talk about what we can do in solidarity and uh, how we can be of support and also how we can help lift people up in these difficult times and what more can we do because there's always more that we can do. And so um, I know that Princess and Apiolani had offered to share something um, as an offering to what's going on. So um, 
Princess, would you like to start and then we'll go to you, Apollonia Ted? Um, yeah, but before I do, I just like wanted to thank Marissa for bringing up um, what she said about having compassion for all people. And that really hit me when you said we, we have to, even the settlers, um, and that's a hard thing to do, um, we have to see ourselves in one another. Because the politics and the nationalism, all this stuff is in many ways an allusion to, you know, this spirit that it happens to be in this human form at this moment in time. We have to be able to see ourselves. And Delena, you know, it's like I look at um, the world is having this awakening right now. And for years, right, we've been trying to educate people about what is manifest destiny, what is the doctrine of discovery. And we can look at, and it's worth mentioning, you know, that the doctrine of discovery and the papal bulls, and that was that debate of our black and brown people that were discovering are they human or not well no it was determined then and there that we are par human we are subhuman um and so i think it's important when we you know and i do um you know i come on my father's side from that history of you know programs and the holocaust and even before the holocaust you know um pogroms and um, violence against Jewish people. And so I have the utmost love and compassion for all human beings. I don't want to see death and destruction and violence against the human or the non-human, against the, the burning of the olive trees or the way that the Jordan River has been stifled to a trickle. The the use of chemical warfare, you know, white phosphorus. I mean, this is happening all around our mother earth, this imbalance. And so I'm just really grateful that you, that you mentioned that, because I think it's very important to say, because the cycle of revenge and vengeance and violence is just going to continue until, you know, those who hold that radical peace you know, and to me, like peace is something, you know, you, that's hard work. Um, and you have to be brave, to, I think, to work towards that, but you have to also have a mind for justice. Um, so I do have a poem, It or I'm not sure how much of a poem it is, but um, it's just something that I wrote when, you know, I don't know if it was in November. I, I I pretty much went into a depression after October 7th um, for a few months. And um, uh, Palestine, where I entered this world in the Mukhtar's house, Aizaria, there is a fence, a border, a wall, it's sitting on my heart, an anchor of concrete and lead. The pain is a chasm stretching across space from me to you. Can I tell you a story? Once the sun shone upon the olive trees, casting shade for children to find refuge, Refuge, a condition of being safe, sheltered, protected. Perhaps it was you and I. We found refuge in the exchange of smiles. We had nothing else. Now borders and walls wherever we turn in this world, and only in the dream world do we traverse them. My heart mourns in ways I can't express, like blood in the stone spilling over time. Can we remember what it means to be human, to love? 
to my Palestinian brothers and sisters, as we bear witness to this genocide, not a day goes by. I do not take some action, however insufficient it feels, for we all deserve to be seen as fully human, to have peace, to nurture our relationships to the land, to be free, to be free, to be free. Masi. Modo Princess, thank you so much. I was, I was, yeah. I, thank you, and thank you, Marissa, for writing us about the compassion. Um, and something you said, Princess, reminded me of um, something that John Trudell, who was a, a Native activist here in the States, um, he always would say, um, we are spiritual beings having a human experience and not human beings having a spiritual experience. And that's what I remind myself every day is that we are spiritual beings and we are having this human experience. And how do we make this human experience more humane for all? And so thank you for that. And um, thank you. Um, I'll put a um, Sure, I have a, um, I have a, a brief song uh, that was written by the chief of uh, my tribe, um, Chief uh, Yuri Ridgeway, and um, and I'm I'm blessed to to be uh, to have the permission uh, to to perform it. Um, so, hi hey hi ha hey ha hey hi hey. I I and uh, as I have accompanied that song uh, with this uh, with this note, as I've as I've said in performances and some protests, um, genocide was wrong in the 16th and 17th century. Genocide was wrong in the 20th century, and genocide is wrong in the 21st century. So, Wanishi, thank you. And oh, and the title of the song is um, "I Remember It, My Land." I remember what was it? I remember my land. I, I remember it, my land. I remember it, my land. That's beautiful. So thank you, Apollonia Tet. That was, and, and thank your elder for letting you share that song with us today. Um, and I love that you know you went through that process. I, I feel like that's a lot of people don't realize there is a there is a reason and a way that we tell our stories and we share the information that we get. We always seek advice from our community and help from our elders. And um, I know that due to everything that's happening now, we are seeing a lot of loss of elders. And and I just wanna just acknowledge that. So thank you so much for, for following the protocol and doing it the right way. And for calling all of our ancestors into the room. I think that's something that we need to remember always is that our ancestors are always with us. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm probably speaking to people that already know this, uh, <laughs> but that's every time we speak, they are standing behind us. Absolutely. And so we are never speaking alone or singing alone or sharing a story alone. We have their strength, their resilience, their joy, their love, their legacy behind us. And I think that's what how I find light in the darkness. And I do feel like we are in a lot of darkness. And I just want to acknowledge that all of you in this room are helping to shine light. And, you know, one of the things my, one of my uh, mentors, uh, Gloria, always said was that she never wanted to pass her torch. She didn't believe in passing the torch. She wanted to hold onto her torch and use it to light other torches so that we were all in the light at all times. There never should just be one torch. And that's one of the things about I think solidarity is, is how we use our torches to light other torches. 
And how do we use our torch to shine light on something that's often in the dark? And so I feel that's something that we are able to do today. And I'm so grateful that you are sharing um, your beautiful words and wisdoms with us and your personal stories. Um, I do feel that's how we build compassion and empathy is when we can be vulnerable with each other and show our our frail human side so that we people know that we are human just like they are. And, you know, going back to Princess, you know, it was it took a court case here in the United States, Standing Bear v. Crook, uh, to establish that we were, in fact, human beings. <laughs> um, and I believe we've only been human for like 100 years now, which is, you know, ridiculous, but exciting um, that we actually we can pinpoint the date that we became human. Um, and I say that in all, you know, sarcasm and facetiousness and irony. But um, but we do actually have a, a set date when we became human. Um, and just to have that moment of acknowledging who we are and sharing our our cultures and our past with the world right now is is beautiful. And I love that it's a cultural exchange. So I appreciate that. Um, and Princess, thank you so much for your, your poem again. And I know that there's been a lot of uh, important events that have been happening in regards to what's going on in Gaza. Uh, a lot of them are not being uh, acknowledged or upheld, but... Um, but the world is, I feel like the world is on our side and acknowledging what is happening. And so I just want to call that into the room too. Um, I know it's never easy. Um, I always wish it were easier for all of us. But um, but the thing is, we, we keep showing up and we keep being there for each other. Princess, I saw you unmuted. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that the world is on our side and... Um, you know, we have to continue to, you know, go to you know, organize um, the rallies, organize ourselves as artists and speak the words and the poetry and hold that vision. And I'm just reminded of um, our medicine and our, <clears throat> you know, how we believe as Indigenous people and encourage people. Um, and I'll just share one one story but you know we we would talk to the elements of course and the weather and as hunter gatherers you know that weather you everything depends on the weather and so we had ways that we communicated you know with the weather and i won't get there's different ways that we did that which i won't get into but the one thing is that everyone in the camp had to believe in what we were saying and what we were doing and so that's why I say, you know, we all have to see Gaza being rebuilt. We have to see the return of people to their traditional homelands. We have to see the thriving olive trees. We have to envision that as a collective and we have to believe in that peace and not be deterred. And we should be filling, filling our spiritual wells at all times because we are in dark times and there's a lot of distractions everywhere you turn. And so find that time to be in meditation, to be in prayer and hold that close and be like this. I mean, our determination should be like antlers, right? All in the same direction. I think um, all of us in this uh, Zoom right now, or on this panel, I guess, are uh, the theater artists, um, Indian film artists, but like storytellers of some kind, right? Um, and I often think about our art form and what good is the thing that we do actually if we can't use. Um, our art form if we can use the thing that we um you know have all um you know trained and spent time developing um the skill set to envision different worlds or better worlds um you know for our people for our community um and i think even here in the u.s right um especially among native people the land back movement is starting to pick up steam which i think um to a lot of settlers sounds ridiculous right like so you're saying you just want me to take this land and give it back like well yes uh, essentially right um 
But, um, you know, what movement for justice um, anywhere in the world did you start as, um, you know, a general thought, an idea, um, a dream that people kept visioning, letting go of until it started and got bigger um, and uh, it became unimaginable and changed things. Um, and so I think uh, you're exactly right, Princess, that we just um, have to. Um, we have to hold within ourselves the ability to envision um, a just and free future for Palestine, for Native people in the U.S., um, and not let that vision go um, and keep working for it. And um, as Ilana said, keep uh, lighting more torches to um, light up the path where it's getting there. I think one of my favorite things about uh, our Native people is a lot of our people believe that stories are medicine. And every time we share our story, we are spreading medicine. And I feel like having these conversations is, you know, it's balms for our souls. We're sharing that medicine. And it's also a reminder that we have survived. And try as people might, we are here still sharing our stories and that their attempts to eliminate us have failed. And I like to, you know, going back to what Princess said about envision, envisioning a free Palestine and envisioning it and into this genocide, it's 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 possible. We can do this. We can make this happen. And I just want to just, you know, acknowledge the resilience of all the people that are watching right now and acknowledge the pain and the heartbreak. And hopefully our words are giving you medicine and we want to be able to provide a way um to share our light with you in this time of darkness. And so I just want to say that and thank you. Abilanya, is there anything that you would like to add? We have about 11 minutes before our session ends. So I want to give everyone a chance for closing remarks. Um sure, sure. Thank you. Um well I just want to say that I I as difficult as it may seem sometimes though, but I think that um theater and the arts uh, it, it, it is a great way to try to fight back and use that solidarity. I, I know, as we've said earlier, um, you know, we are actually spiritual beings first, and and art and 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 the um, the live visceral community building aspect of theater um, uh, can do that, and, and and is and is a great way to do that. And uh, and I think um, you know, forming alliances um, with like minded colleagues and 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 friends. Um, in this is also another 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 great way to do it. Um, I um, it's been very inspirational to to see the the protests that happened this spring. I certainly hope that they continue later this summer and into the fall. Um, and uh, I know I will certainly uh, do what I can to be a part of that. And um, and it's been a real privilege and honor to be with to to share space with all of you today. Um, I've, uh, I've I certainly learned a lot and have, and have filled my well. And, and and we'll certainly take that to other uh, spaces in the future. So, Wanishi, thank you so much. Thank you, Apelonia. I appreciate that. Princess, is there anything you would like to say in our few remaining moments? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that I'm on the board of Indian Collective, which is the largest, you know, grassroots indigenous-led organization on Turtle Island. And if um, and I can share the link, but we have made uh, a couple of statements about our standing in solidarity with Palestine. The first we made, I believe, in 2021, when there was a kind of um, uptick in viol settler violence, and um, we made it then, and we've continued to just stand strong and make it known um, that we're standing in solidarity and and why that is. So there's some um, we have a paper. Um, that I encourage people to read on our stance. And I just want to say, um, again, um, just grateful to be in community with you all and um, echo what Delena said, that I hope that this is in some way, shape, or form um, a balm and encourage people to continue to take action and uh, not be apathetic and not be disillusioned um, or be disillusioned and let your <laughs> let that drive be the driving force of your action. Um, and I'm reminded daily to um, 
transform my rage and my grief and these stronger emotions into something um, actionable that I can feel good about that feels um, like I'm actually doing something because the world is trying to tell us that it's hopeless and I refuse to accept that. So must see. And Marissa, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? Yeah, so it comes with words which me hopeless. Um, and I uh, sit in my apartment in Chicago and I think, you know, what can I possibly do, um, you know, that would be of, you know, value to anyone in the situation? Um, but I think the thing that all of us can do, right, is never stop talking about how it's um, in every country that I have traveled to um, between October 7th and now, I have seen um, public art, public statements in support of the Palestinian people, in support of freedom for Palestine. Um, and so this, this is a global movement. We are not a minority. Um, and we have to keep the conversation going um, and make sure that um, freedom for Palestinian people never stops being part of the conversation and that freedom for Native people in the U.S. never stops being part of the conversation also um, because I, um, in the months since October 5th, have found it um, really, I guess, astounding but not surprising how many um, uh, settlers in the United States uh, do not understand that in the U.S. context for Native people, like, they are the settlers, right? They are the ones who um, bulldoze somebody else's home and are living in it now. Um, that their presence here was made possible by um, historical and ongoing genocide towards Native people. But um, I think, you know, kind of back to like, all of the conversations that we've had today that um, really just speaks to why it is so very, very important uh, for us as Native people to be in solidarity with the people of Palestine. Um, and also, yeah, for all of us to um, just keep fighting and keep working um, for a more just world for a world. Yes, Ryan. Uh, if I may, because in addition to, to to my own company, Eagle Project, I'm also on the advisory committee of an organization called Donkey Saddle, and they and they do tremendous work um, in in Palestine, and they've been doing work on the ground in Gaza, um, uh, helping children, helping people get out. So, um, and they also use arts in many ways to help facilitate this. So, uh, um, they have many good ways to help. So, please check them out as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other organizations or uh, resources you'd like to uplift at this moment in the last few remaining minutes? I know that uh, Princess has shared uh, Indian Collective, and that's the letters N as in Nancy, D as in Donkey, N as in Nancy, collective.org. Um, and Ryan just shared Donkey Saddle. Is that correct? Fantastic. And um, But if there's any other resources or or organizations you'd like to uplift, we can do that at this moment as well. I know there's a lot of things happening, but at the same time, you know, just to reiterate what Marissa just said and or, or echo it, if I will, is they have tried for so long to silence us. Our voices are the strongest weapon we have, and we must keep using our voices to to not let them make this an erased item like they've done with so many things of our past. We cannot let them erase what's happening. We must be vocal. We must share our stories. We must speak out. Um, and, you know, once again, as a reminder, even if you are feeling like you're the only one speaking out, your ancestors are right there with you and they will hold you up when you don't feel like you can stand. So um, trust on that. It's in our DNA. You know, it's it's in our blood memory. Um, we are never alone. And, you know, together, one voice from Oklahoma, one voice from Alaska, one voice from, where are you, Ryan, are you in New Jersey or New York? Right now, I'm currently in New York City, yeah. New York City. And Marissa, I think you said you're in Georgia. <laughs> I, 
I believe really, you're stuck. Yeah, you're stranded in, in Atlanta. Is that right? Yeah. You know, we might be one voice in whatever region we're in, but together we are we are so vocal. We can be the we can be, you know, that big tsunami that takes over. And so I just want to encourage everyone to share and to not stop, you know, and to keep talking about what's happening. And like I said, we cannot let this be something that gets erased. And so um and we can't let these people be erased. And so I just want to acknowledge that and say thank you all. Uh, we have about three minutes left, but I just want to also let everyone know that the next session is coming up. It is called, uh, it's session 21. It's Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, a Call to Action. So if you're looking for further ways to be of service and what you can do, guess what? The next session is going to address that and also show you how you can um, you know, put your money uh, or take away your money. And find a way to uh, to be supportive of the people that's happening. And that will be moderated by May Sikinobu. And so, um, I, yes, yes, sanctions. I love that Princess just said that in the in the chat. I don't think everyone can see our chat. And so um, I believe that's just for us. But uh, we have been talking through the chat and sharing resources that way. But also, um, I do believe the next session is going to be very important. So I hope everyone can stay and stick, you know, stick around and watch it. And if you can't, don't worry, it will be archived on HowlRound. You'll be able to find it. And uh, hopefully um, there will be a list of everything that they share. Uh, a, there is also a resource list in the digital program. Um, it's on the HowlRound page with the live stream. So we'll hopefully we'll get a list of all the people that we should be boycotting or divesting from and also a call for sanction. So uh, just, just a heads up on that. That'll be the next uh, situation. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, our amazing panelists, Apilani Touch, Princess, Marissa. I am so grateful that with everything that's going on with your day-to-day -day lives, um, that you were able to participate today. I know, uh, I think you all were traveling yesterday. Um, so to have you all here today is such a blessing. And I just want to call that into the room and say thank you for making that happen. I know that's a lot of work to do when you've been traveling and then you pop on and have to be somewhat social. So thank you for that. And um, at this time, I guess we will say goodbye to our amazing panelists and thank you for joining us for this session. And we will turn it over to the next session. So May, it's been, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much.